Wigs and Means on May 5th. Um, and we are meeting on a couple of issues this morning. Uh, the first one is the uh, proposal from the state treasurer on how we can support municipal, short-term municipal borrowing. Um, and it's a, some language that the treasurer's office has put together that our legislative council has looked at and is gonna review for us. Um, and so that'll be the first piece. And then um, we're gonna shift gears and talk about education finance um, and which will include a discussion of recent um, guidance from the treasurer's office, which I will um, give you the um, warning that it's actually not particularly helpful. So uh, just uh, we'll talk about that when we get it. I think all the committee members have it and it will be posted on our uh, webpage as soon as Sorsha is able to do that. So uh, before we get started, is there anything anyone wants to um, or announce or whatever. Uh, George. There are still a couple people who aren't muted <clears throat> and I'm getting periodic a little bit of feedback. Could they please mute? Great. Good. Thanks. You want to name and shame? <laughs> <laughs> At some point, it will be every one of us. Uh, so, um, okay, anything else? Good. Uh, so, um, Beth Pierce, welcome uh, to the committee. Uh, thank you for joining us again. Um, we've had the opportunity to um, visit with you several times over the last week or so. And so if you don't mind um, talking to the committee sort of at a high level about what it is that the uh, treasurer's office is um, suggesting, and then we'll have um, Becky go through the language in some detail with the committee. Certainly. So for the record, it's Beth Pierce, the state treasurer, and uh, appreciate all the work that all of you have been doing. Uh, you've heard from me several times, but so many other folks have been working through this. So thank you for your service, and thank you for the attention that you're giving these issues. Uh, in terms of the education fund and the cash flows, um, as I said, we would be making the, uh, the Act 68 payments uh, on schedule on April 30th, and that was $163.4 million. Uh, the next payments are in September, uh, September 10th and December 10th. Um, and on the other side, uh, we're, we're, we're expecting that the bills have gone out by the Agency of Education, uh, payments by municipalities uh, with a due date of June 1st. And that's approximately $88 million. Uh, and um, uh, we, again, expect that that will come in. And the next due date on that is December uh, 1st. Um, as you know, uh, um, uh, Beth, can I interrupt for just a second. Um, I had absolutely. thought those payments were June 30th. They're June 1st? They're June 1st. Oh, OK. I had that incorrect. Thank you. Yep. OK. okay. Um, so. Um, uh, so many municipalities, as you know, are experiencing some cash flow impacts uh, due to the delays or deferrals in the receipt of those property taxes. And uh, the, uh, the committee has been looking at different ways to address that and uh, been very thoughtful in listening to all parties and uh, appreciate that process. Um, you had a previous presentation, um, I'm not sure from who, it was on your website that showed the, uh, that. Um, that uh, the number of towns uh, that uh, payments, uh, number of towns is 259, uh, that uh, property tax revenues um, uh, were um, uh, received uh, through 315, but um, left outstanding after 315 of about 132 million uh, with I believe about 82 um, um, uh, uh, towns with out outstanding payments. We, um, we took a look at that. Uh, we talked to you folks on not several ideas on municipal borrowing. And uh, as a result of uh, working with this committee, and I want to thank you for your due diligence on this, I think we, we looked at a number of options. Uh, there was something out there called the Municipal Liquidity Facility uh, that the feds had. Ultimately, we found that that wasn't going to work. Uh, they um, uh, they had a very high level of population that you had to meet to, to satisfy that to do it directly as opposed to the state. You had to have a population of 500,000. Uh, having heard from all the, all the uh, states on, on this, they dropped it to 250,000 um, 
in, in each city or municipality. So that's not going to help us very much. Uh, but the biggest issue is the Federal Reserve uses this authority as a lender of last resort. So they're going to tack on a penalty rate or, or premium to the market rate. Um, and that, uh, that does not appear to be an option for Vermont. So we took a look at other ways to do it and uh, ultimately uh, came up with uh, using a short-term borrowing through local banks uh, through established networks. And as we pointed out uh, in our last presentation, and you heard from Chris Delia from the Vermont Bankers Association, the banks are willing to step up to the plate as they always have. Uh, they've been good partners uh, through Irene and uh, the May floods in 2011 and so many other um, um, issues. And uh, we wanted to work through those networks. Uh, the, we've looked at other alternatives, uh, the bond bank, um, um, frankly, is something that uh, deals more with infrastructure and not revenue, and it would also impact the, potentially the state's moral obligation. So we thought that the, the, um, using the local banks would be the appropriate way to do it. Um, we hoped and we believe that uh, COVID-19 um, dollars will be able to reimburse the cost of interest. So what we would be doing is saying, locals, you will do your own borrowing. There will be an interest cost associated with that, but the state will reimburse you for that interest cost. And uh, we expect in, uh, that uh, that it will be uh, something that's um, uh, reimbursable under the uh, 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 the the, uh, uh, the federal government. Uh, it's not in the guidance that we've seen to date. Do you want me to stop there? I think I heard a question. Uh, no, nope. um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, so. No. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, we think that uh, it will be reimbursable. There were some conversations between the NGA um, and uh, NASBO on this issue, and uh, we we think that uh, that that will, we have a high probability that that will be uh, an expense that will be reimbursable. So hence uh, the st the material that uh, Rebecca is uh, going to go over in line by line. We try to line it up with the uh, with the requirements of. Um, of the, um, um, uh, the, the relief fund uh, from the federal government. Uh, it's the intent of the state um, to, as I said, to the maximum extent possible to collect those dollars. We did have to form a new fund for this because when you receive dollars and you put it in that purpose, we thought that was the best approach. Um, and I think that uh, Ledge Council agreed with that approach. Uh, so we think this is a good short-term uh, solution uh, the long term or, or intermediate, a five to ten year, um, if the, if communities are continuing to have um, uh, some issues with their their revenue flow, um, the FEMA Community Disaster Loan Program, which uh, has not been used on, in this state at any point in time, um, but it is out there, um, and I've noticed on the federal uh, websites that they're actually hiring up for this program, uh, may provide it uh, an alternative. It allows you to borrow and kind of smooth over uh, some of your revenue uh, losses over a period of five to up to 10 years. And if there's a cumulative deficit after three years, it provides for some loan forgiveness um, or uh, in whole or in part. Uh, so we think that that's a good, once you get through the short term, if um, what you may want to opt and take a look at that as a, as a, as a longer term to, to address these issues. So what we've tried to do is come up with a continuum of options to assist the municipalities. And uh, we think that this uh, is a good approach. Uh, I want to thank the committee because a lot of this came from discussion with uh, the chair and, and the members of the committee and, and the various uh, presentations that we have. And uh, we're, uh, we're hopeful that uh, this will be something that you're interested in. And I'll stop for questions um, and, uh, uh, or turn it over to Rebecca, whatever you folks want to do. Um, uh, thank you very much. And um, I don't see questions um, at the moment. So let's get the draft in front of the committee and start working our way through it and see um, see whether, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are ways, things the committee can come up with that will make it better. Um, and I also want to say that I'm not exactly sure, assuming that we come to a landing place with this idea, um, I'm not exactly sure what 
form it's going to take, whether it's going to be a committee bill out of this committee, whether we'll go, whether we'll hand our work over, for example, to the GovOps committee or appropriations and ask them to include it in a bill. But I'm going to worry about that later. Um, right now, I just want to make, I want to get to a place where um, at least we all are comfortable with the language. So um, Becky Wasserman, thank you for joining us. I had to unmute myself. Uh, so Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. I think um, Sorsha just pulled up the draft. Um, so uh, this, uh, as the treasurer just explained, this is just putting um, the proposal into a bill format, but um, there's it's not a particular bill yet. Um, it's just draft language. Um, so if uh, we can scroll down a little bit, um, section one, uh, is the uh, creation of the, um, we need to go up a little bit more, is the creation of the, the program. And uh, subsection A is an intent section. So this um, says that it's the intent of the General Assembly to establish this program to assist municipalities that are required to make a short-term borrowing to manage the, the cash flow effects of property tax deferrals or delays in receipt of such taxes by municipalities as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then um, the language goes on on line six to um, say that the, the program shall be administered in a way that is consistent with the CARES Act and any guidance or regulations that are issued per pursuant to the that section of the CARES Act 5001, which creates the Coronavirus Relief Fund. And um, part of this intent, uh, starting on line nine, is that uh, the state is allowed to recover to the maximum extent possible the short-term borrowing costs payable to municipalities from the Coronavirus Relief Fund um, established in the CARES Act as may be amended. And um, the as may be amended on line 12 is trying to capture if there's some additional federal guidance or legislation that comes out that sort of expands what can be provided to municipalities. Okay, so subsection B uh, creates some, some definitions. So short-term borrowing costs as used in this program means interest incurred for short-term borrowing directly attributable to the COVID-19 pandemic. And this includes letters or lines of credit, revenue anticipation notes, tax anticipation notes, and bond anticipation notes. And then subdivision two on line 17 um, clarifies what it does not mean. So it does not mean the principal payments of any borrowing or any interest on borrowing not directly attributable to the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so subsection C lays out uh, the program a little more. Um, the, the program is established to authorize the state treasurer to make payments to municipalities to cover the short-term borrowing costs incurred directly um, attributable to COVID-19. And subsection D is an application process. So a municipality that has uh, duly authorized a short-term borrowing um, as a result of COVID-19 may apply to the state treasurer for payment under the program. And um, the state treasurer will prescribe the, the application form, but at a minimum, it has to include certain things. So um, starting on line nine, this is uh, subdivision one is the amount and type of short-term borrowing costs that the municipality seeks to have reimbursed. Two is the municipality's 2020 tax collection date Three is an explanation with supporting documents of the municipality's under collection or delay in property tax collection that's attributable to COVID-19. And then finally, um, certification by the municipality and um, supporting documentation that such costs meet the de definition of short-term borrowing that's defined in subsection B, as well as the ed eligibility criteria that um, are defined in subsection E, which is uh, the next subsection. Um, so subsection E uh, uh, lays out how a municipality is eligible. So um, the program is only available to municipality as that term is defined in 1 VSA section 126 and subject to certain criteria. 
And this is where it, it tries to line up with um, the language in the Coronavirus Relief Fund in the CARES Act. Um, so short-term borrowing costs were not included in the municipality's budget or any amendment to the budget enacted on or prior to March 27th, 2020. The short-term borrowing costs were incurred um, in the period March, beginning March 1st of this year and ending December 30th of this year. Uh, the borrowing was made for the purpose of managing the cash flow effects of property tax deferrals or delays as a result of COVID-19. Subdivision four is uh, the expenses must be consistent with the use of funds authorized in the CARE Act, CARES Act as may be amended. And then finally, any borrowing interest must be commercially reasonable based on published municipal indices or prevailing bank rates. Uh, subsection F on line 15 is the administration of the program. So um, there's some highlighted uh, spaces here for, I guess, the, the committee to, to discuss, but the treasurer will uh, specify the form of certification to the municipalities not later than a certain date, and that needs to be filled in. And then um, as well as the date for when the treasurer would begin accepting applications for the program. Um, subdivision two uh, allows the treasurer to be reimbursed for any expenditure made in the administration of the program. Um, and then finally, subsection G uh, requires that a municipality keep records that are sufficient to demonstrate that the payments, um, the amount of the payments going to the municipality has been used in accordance with the requirements of the program. Um, so moving on to section two, um, this section establishes the fund from which the payments will be uh, made out of. And uh, this is created in the state treasury. And I have highlighted here um, pursuant to 32 VSA chapter seven, subchapter five. Um, I added that in more as a question because this is the, the subchapter that deals with the creation of special funds. And I, um, I just didn't know if this fund would be following those requirements those rules. I don't know if there's something specific about the CARES Act funding that would um, mean that it should not uh, follow those rules, but that's just uh, a question for the committee. Um, and the fund would be administered by the state treasurer. And then uh, another question I have is how the money in the fund would be used. So uh, right now it says it would be used solely for payments made to municipalities under the program. And then I've also added in and for necessary costs incurred in administering the fund. So in uh, section 1F, there's uh, the treasurer is allowed to seek reimbursement for administration costs of the program. Um, so if that doesn't come out of this fund, it would have to come out of some other appropriation perhaps to the, the treasurer. So I just wanted to highlight that as well for the committee. Um, and then subsection B says the fund shall consist of any sums that may be appropriated or transferred to the fund. And um, the state treasurer is also um, authorized to seek any gifts, donations, and grants from any public or private source to be dedicated for deposit into the fund. Section three is the appropriation section. Um, this is also left blank here, but it's um, an appropriation of a certain amount to go into the fund in FY 2020. And I've also highlighted that because I, I wasn't sure if there was net, in, there needed to be an appropriation in 2020 as well as 2021. And then finally, section four is the effective date. So this would take effect on passage. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Uh, let me see if there's any questions, anyone? Thoughts, comments, uh, Robin. Thank you. Um, thanks for this, Becky. I'm wondering with the definition of municipality, and I did pull it up, whether there would be any, um, whether it would be fine or whether there would be any unintended question, uh, consequences because for example, um, solid waste districts are considered municipalities and could they borrow under this? And so do we end up by using that complete definition um, creating something else that we hadn't intended? Um, so that that's 
correct that that uh, definition includes um, school districts, fire districts, and I, I can pull it up and, and uh, let you know everything that's included in there. Um, so I think part of it is I don't know I don't know the answer to whether those districts would be incurring short term borrowing costs um, for property tax deferrals. Um, so I don't know if they would actually qualify under the program. Um, that might be a question for the treasurer to answer if um, that would perhaps come up. If so, those could certainly be exempt. Um, but the, the full definition is a city, town, town school district, incorporated school or fire district, or incorporated village, and all other governmental incorporated units. So there, so in addition to meeting that definition, they would also, the district would also have to have incurred some sort of deferral of property tax or delay of collection of property tax. Um, and uh, as a result of COVID-19. So I ask, I don't know if those situations would apply to um, districts other than, you know, municipalities or school districts. Uh, Emily. Thanks. There's um, a line in here about sort of pursuant to CARES Act, um, the expenses must be consistent with use of funds authorized in section 5001 of the CARES Act as may be amended. And so I'm curious about in that context with um, how much we still don't quite seem to know what any of that means if the liability for um, if the liability on that would sit with the municipality or with the state and or treasurer's office if it turned out that funds were not being used um, in accordance with that um well i think the program is a program that is authorized through the state treasurer but um I actually don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't know if the treasurer's office has any thought on that. Um, I, don't, I don't know that the state would be guaranteeing the program if there are no, there's no money that is deposited into the fund. I think the way it's drafted right now is that sort of, if there's money in the fund, the treasurer can make payments to municipalities that meet that criteria. But if there is no money in the fund and the state is not otherwise appropriating money into it, then um, I think the program wouldn't wouldn't be operating, but uh, I think maybe the treasurer can can speak to that liability a little bit more. Madam Chair, would you like me to address that? Yes, thank you. So I think there are a couple of things. One of the reasons we structured it the way we did is that uh, rather than have us do the borrowing, is that the municipalities ultimately have the credit on their books as opposed to the state uh, picking that up. Um, with any fund that's a um, uh, federal fund, um, typically I should say, um, uh, they, uh, uh, there's a uh, requirement uh, to, to be involved in a single audit, to have that subject to the single audit. And there would be what's called sub-recipient uh, monitoring of this, which the treasurer's office would have to um, assume um, in this particular model. Um, but ultimately, if there was a non-compliance, it would accrue to the, um, um, to to the um, uh, the municipalities uh, in this process, which is why they have to provide substantiation and uh, the, you know it, this stuff. Uh, excuse me, uh, bad word stuff. But this uh, this this would uh, be subject to um, to uh, review um, potentially by the inspector general. But uh, um, you know again, uh, that's the reason we ask for substantiation and certification at the uh, at the local level. Um, you know, with uh, respect to the appropriation, our, our expectation is that we will be reimbursed um, by COVID, but we would expect an appropriation to be done in, um, in anticipation of that uh, if we were to move forward. Um, you know, at this point, June 1st is coming rather quickly, and we would, we would expect that there would need to be an appropriation in place uh, with the intent, as we said at the beginning, uh, to, um, to, to, uh, to use COVID dollars um, um, if, if they are deemed appropriate for this. Uh, again, we haven't seen any specific clarification on that uh, other than the, um, 
uh, the communication between the uh, NGA and uh, uh, NASBO, uh, the National Association of Budget Officers, I believe that's the title, and uh, and they're meeting with the uh, White House and in, uh, in the Treasury Department. So I don't know if I answered that or if I need to step back and provide a different uh, additional explanation. No, that's helpful. Thank you. I think I was thinking of a scenario where you know we do appropriate in advance and the mm -hmm. towns borrow um, and then expecting for us to pay the interest and then something changes in the guidelines of the CARES Act yeah. and sort of who, does that mean we will then at that point not be paying the interest? I think that's sort of, but I think you answered it, so. Yeah, I, I would think that we would ha have to appropriate anticipation and there is a risk to the state if we do that. Um, but uh, I think it's the right thing to do. The risk to the state is is the is the cost of the borrowing. Correct. It, it's limited to that. Um, let me see if there's other question. Mark. Um, Becky, would would the language that you've drafted cover a school district in the event it had to go out and borrow because it didn't receive um, a timely payment from the municipality? Because municipalities are the tax raising entities and school districts are the spending entity, even though they're both municipalities. Mm -hmm. Would this cover a school district that had to go out and borrow to fill, fill in temporarily? So a school district fits the definition of a municipality in um, 1 VSA 126. Um, I, th I think if all the other eligibility criteria were met, it, it um, does not exempt a school district in that situation. So it seems like it would cover cover school district. Even though they're not a taxing entity. It, if there was. Um, I, I thought it had to be the, um, the taxing entity, but maybe I misunderstood. Was that your question, Mark? Yes. Yeah. Um, school, school districts don't, um, don't collect taxes. Let me just pull up, uh, I don't have the, can you pull up the language again? I think there is the language about either a property tax uh, deferral or um, uncollected and or delay do, in collection. Wait, and they don't, they don't collect, right? So. Okay, they, so they if, if they wouldn't, right. if they wouldn't meet either, either of those scenarios, then um, it, it would not be covered. I think the only way we could, if we wanted them to be covered, I think we would have to explicitly say that they they can be and that they don't have to meet those tax collecting requirements. I don't I don't know whether we want them to be, but um, but that is um, something we should talk about. Uh, Bill Canfield. Oh, I had Bill Talbot wanting to jump in. Bill Canfield, you go ahead, and then I'll get to you, Bill Talbot. Okay. Um, section two, small e. Um, Subset one, section, uh, let's see, short-term borrowing costs uh, were not included in the municipal's budget or any amendment to the budget enacted on or be prior to March 21, 2024, 2020. Um, it seems in our committee discussions that there's a maybe one or two municipalities that don't have their town meeting until May. Are we going to leave somebody out here? Mark or uh, Becky, do you want to jump in? So it this is saying that the costs were not included in a budget. So if um, if the budget has not been passed yet, then I, I think that it would it would qualify under this. I think it's saying if it if it was if a budget was enacted, let's say in early March, and those costs were included in that budget, then it would it would not apply here. But first. But for a town that has not enacted a budget yet, then this wouldn't be a problem. Okay, thank you. Um, if not, let me just see if there's other people with questions. Hold on. Uh, so I'll ask mine. Uh, oh, no, Bill Tabbitt, you wanted to jump in. You go ahead. Um, the, the only thing about uh, school districts being eligible, there are fewer of them now as of Act 46, but incorporated districts are taxing entities. There's, there used to be 11, I, I don't know how many there are now, but anyway, so there's a few that still oh, okay. uh, have the authority to collect taxes. Okay, interesting. And something every day. 
Um, so I, I'm sort of looking at the um, effective date. Uh, this is effective on passage uh, by its terms. It seems to be limited to the pandemic, um, but there's no end date to it. And that was intentional. Is that right? It would apply to both fiscal 20 and 21. And as long as we're in a pandemic situation, it would continue to be possible. Right. So there, there is no end date. That is something that I noted as well. Um, and it, I also had a question about whether this appropriation would be made for both 20 and 21. Um, yeah. But I think that since it has to be attributable to COVID-19, um, there is yeah. sort of an end date in that sense, but the committee could certainly decide to add in um, that this is like a one year program or however long um, it is, it's appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I had one um, sort of more general question. Um, this is, I think, for Beth. Um, the, and Karen, I don't know if you wanted to jump in or not, but this came out of a conversation Karen and I had yesterday is just whether um, it would be possible for the treasurer to, rather than have all the towns go out shopping for loans, whether it would be possible for the treasurer to designate a bank and an interest rate that all the towns would use so that we would have, um, you know, um, that would be easier certainly for the towns and it would be, um, we would at least know what the interest rate is that the state is going to end up paying. So um, Beth, do you wanna, have you had any thoughts about that since yesterday? Sure, certainly, um, so I did talk to um, um, the uh, Chris Delia from the uh, Vermont Bankers Association and taking a look at uh, uh, our, our banks, um, I think that you need to spread this across several banks uh, rather than um, one central, unless you wanted to go out of state. And um, mm -hmm. um, I don't think that any of us want to have an out of state bank uh, doing this. Mm -hmm. um, also, banks know their customers, so uh, and they have a sense of their financials already. Uh, so it, it might make more sense to have um, uh, a bank that's um, that has dealt with their customer, has an understanding of their credit history, um, and has done these types of loans in the past um, uh, 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 to um, to municipalities um, um, do that process. The only alternative would possibly be that municipal liquidity um, um, uh, facility at the federal level. That uh, to me. Um, is not appropriate starting with it, to, it. You have to certify, my understanding is that you have to certify that you um, you exhausted all other alternatives, i.e. Um, a, a local bank, uh, and that uh, there would be a penalty over and above the, the normal interest rate. Uh, we can work with the banks and we will continue. We've got a good working relationship with our banking community as do the municipalities. Um, to um, to to continue to provide provide some guidance, and if someone is having difficulty uh, working out a um, a um, uh, particular lending ar arrangement, um, uh, I would say give you the Chris or I a call um, uh, or or me, and then I'll reach out and and find out what's going on. We want to make sure that um, banks do have that. Uh, excuse me, municipalities do have um, um, some ease in this process. Um, at the same time, recognizing uh, the, the capacity to do this and uh, 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 the uh, distribution of those banking resources. Um, but uh, I understand the desire to do that. I think there would be more impediments. Mm -hmm. If we were to go out, for instance, and get a, uh, um, uh, a national bank, uh, they would not be familiar with the credit profiles of our municipalities. And while it might make sense on one side, it would probably create some more uh, delays as they as they're trying to get up to speed on on, on those issues. So, okay, thanks. That's helpful. Um, and Karen, I, I know you're on the call, and I wanted to give you a chance to uh, weigh in if you'd like to. I don't have other committee questions at the moment. Would you like to um, comment? Thank you, thank you. I, I do have a a few comments on the draft, if I may. Sure. Um, yes. uh, with respect, and this is just going off the draft that um, I'm looking at here, with respect to um, section one sub A, it talks about the CARE Act, but it, we may want to also say something to the effect of any subsequent federal aid package for which the fund qualifies, you know, 
just not to limit it just to the CARES Act. Um, and then uh, in, in section B there on line one, short-term borrowing costs means interest incurred for borrowing directly attributable to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I don't know if the committee might be interested in including costs of administration at the town level as they do as is contemplated for the treasurer. Um, uh, the, the definition of municipality in, in Title I is I think about the most expansive definition that's out there. There are plenty of other places in the statute where municipality is limited to a city, town, or incorporated village in Title 24. Um, in Title 22, it's a town, city, or incorporated village, not a school district. And in Title 32, it's a city, town, village, and school district. So there's, um, there's lots of ways that you could narrow the eligibility. And I, and I think that um, you may want to do that in this circumstance. Um, with respect to the idea of um, the thought about having the treasurer um, work with a bank to establish a essentially an interest rate, would, would it seems to me that it would just remove one of the variables from the loan fund and maybe there's some way to establish the uh, an interest rate or a um, range of interest rates that that towns could use and still have it be the banks in Vermont that are offering that. I, I'm not the financier here, but it, it seems like there might be a, a fairly simple way to put some parameters around that. And it just seems like it would be um, a, a little bit easier to uh, deal with, you know, reporting and administration and did it qual did the loan qualify and all those kinds of um, issues that we run into. But uh, uh, by and large, I, I think this is tremendously helpful and um, will we'll go a long way toward calming municipal concerns right now about what's gonna happen in the current fiscal year. Thank you. Hey. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for your work on this. Um, and I looked at it over the weekend as well. Um, it certainly uh, it makes sense to me to, to redo the language so that any federal um, app that's available would be used. Um, I, I'm wondering on the, um, I'll let the committee figure out about the uh, costs other than interest costs. I don't have an opinion about it particularly. Um, but I'm wondering whether if we included some uh, authorizing language um, for the treasurer to um, reach out to banks to negotiate interest rates, we're not requiring it, but we could uh, suggest it. And I agree that to the extent uh, it sounds as though um, the treasurer uh, is, is ready to be as helpful as, as she can to the municipalities. And if we include some language that sort of supports that and encourages that, I think that might, um, that might be helpful. It's not, not telling you that you would be doing anything that you wouldn't otherwise be doing, um, but it may give some reassurance to, um, to the towns and to legislators who are looking at this. Um, any uh, other comments that people are, or comments to what I said? Um, any other thoughts that anyone wants to throw out there? Looking for raised hands. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Scott. Yeah, my only only comment is that um, I think it's it's wise to let the municipalities follow the process as much as is possible or practicable. And that includes uh, using the banks that they're comfortable working with and have a history with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other thoughts, uh, are we 
Um, do we want to see another draft with those changes um, that we've talked about? Does that make sense? I, th I think the more I hear about this, this really is going to have to go to um, government operations should certainly look at it because they're more familiar with some of the issues. I like the idea of using the more narrow definition of municipality it makes sense to me. Um, and it clearly needs to um, needs to be in the appropriations committee. It's not really a revenue bill. Um, it came out of the discussions that we've had. Um, so I think we were in a good position to work on it. Um, but I think uh, what um, if if we can see another draft and we um, even informally endorse what we've got here, I think what I probably will do is um, check with the speaker and with um, uh, probably with Kitty to see what sort of what the best way is to move it forward. Is is that agreeable with people? Generally, head nodding. I don't know. Nobody yep. saying no. Everybody's saying yes. Okay. <laughs> um, trying to figure out how best to move this along, and it would be really good to move something fairly quickly. So um, I don't know, Becky, whether you'd be able to have something that we could look at tomorrow and kind of conclude our work on this. Yeah, I can do that. yeah, great. Good. Uh, Beth, thank you very much for your help and um, involvement with this. And um, Karen, uh, you as well. You've done um, good work with your members. And um, it's been, um, it's been a, a good effort, I think, with um, you and the committee. Um, it does make me want to ask whether, uh, and I realize that I probably should, Probably should have warned you if I'm going to tread into those, these waters. But um, at some point, um, it, it, you and I have talked privately a little bit about whether it's time to think about having the state take over the collection of the education tax so that we're not in this situation um, again. And I don't know if that's a conversation that we should be having now, whether you want to make any comments about it or whether it's just something I'll drop on the table and then leave there um, and return to some other time. Well, I, I, this is Karen Horn again. I, I do think that, that the current situation has laid bare all the limitations of the current way we do things and um, we municipalities, I think, would be far more interested in that conversation than they were, say, 10 years ago, or whenever the last time was that we really talked about it seriously. Yeah. Um, it, the, it seems like there are other ways to do this, and we would welcome that conversation. I mean, it, it might be. It, uh, I don't know that it would be part of this bill, although it, it could be. I mean, I'm, I'm, and sort of thinking out, thinking out loud, um, that that what makes sense to do now is uh, some something that starts it in, in motion, so that we're getting a, a framework and a plan from the tax department about what how it would happen. I know that there were it takes um, takes time to phase in a change like that, um, so it's not something you can you can. Uh, flick a switch and have that happen. Um, so if we think it's something we want to pursue, uh, maybe it's something that we need to um, take the first steps on. Um, committee members, anyone want to jump in? Uh, George. Yeah, I would cer certainly um, agree with pursuing that and maybe putting something in this this bill, if we're going to pass it to say, you know, okay, we, tax department, we need you to begin setting up the, for the possibility of the state collecting these taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, Robin. And I agree with what George said. <laughs> Scott. Like, are you, I think you're still muted. You think I'd figure that out after all these weeks? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I think it's worth talking about. I think it's also worth knowing if the tax structure commission is considering it as part of their work. Mm -hmm. And I also think mm -hmm. that the, a, a related co tangential conversation mm -hmm. should have be had about um, our rules concerning escrow. 
And because um, I think that's the big pinch here too. It's not just at the municipal level, it's at the um, individual level also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we've, we've had bills to uh, change the way uh, the property, the education tax is administered. Um, I, I don't think uh, Abby or Becky have worked on them. I know Mark has worked on um, proposals. So, and probably Bill, you probably have, Talbot. Um, so I guess what I'll do is I'll um, ask staff if they could uh, dust off some of the old ideas um, and see whether we can at least put something in that, um, that moves it forward, that initiates the conversation that begin, uh, some of the issues that we used to have, we no longer have. And I bet there are issues that we didn't used to have that we do have now. So, you know, things have changed. Um, and so let's, um, let's look at something that would get us moving in that direction. Um, because this is it, it, the difficulty um, for the municipalities in the role that they have as the collector um, has just been horrendous. Um, and it really, um, it, it would be easier for them and certainly easier for, for the state, um, not easier for the tax department, but easier for the state as a whole um, and to, um, and, make this change and have the state uh, be responsible for not just setting the rate and collecting the money, but um, not just setting the rate and paying the money, but also collecting it. Um, okay, is that okay with everybody? Good, okay. And Karen, we'll keep you involved in that discussion as well. Thank you. Yeah, uh, good, okay. Um, so, so I think we're going to shift uh, to the ed finance discussion, and um, this uh, new guidance from Treasury that we got—I don't know that staff saw it before about seven this morning. So I, mean, I first saw it, something like that. Um, so people have not had much time to take it in or digest it or analyze it, but. Um, based on the plain reading of the words, um, it probably uh, makes the discussion I was hoping to have uh, moot. So I thought it would be good to lay it out there and um, get the committees thinking about sort of what our next steps might look like. So I don't know, Mark, between you, Mark, let's see, Mark, Becky, and Abby, I'm not sure who is gonna, um, Introduce us to this gosh awful idea. <laughs> Hopefully, one of the two attorneys. <laughs> I can step in. <laughs> um, you want me to just launch into it? Yeah. Okay. So, um, for the record, Abby Shepard, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, this guidance that we really first saw at about seven seven thirty this morning um, clarifies some of the CARES Act requirements for the coronavirus fund. Um, allocation that Vermont has received. So just for a quick reminder, the CARES Act requires payments from the fund to be used to cover costs that are necessary expenditures incurred due to the public health emergency that were not accounted for in budgets um, approved as of March 27th, and that were they must be incurred during the period um, that ends on December 30th of this year. So the new guidance that can has I, come can out. Can I stop you just long enough to ask Sorsha if she was able to get this posted on the on the web page? Uh, I think um, believe that's Madam, what we're looking at. I'm sorry. Um, Madam Chair, I was not able I was not oh. able to get it posted to our web page. They're having a technical okay. issue with um, the server, so I'll okay. get it up as soon as okay. they resolve that. Okay. okay. So everybody has it in an email, though. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Sorry, right, didn't mean to interrupt. I should have asked ahead of time. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. So that um, what I just went over were was the original um, requirements that were placed on this funding. In this new guidance as of yesterday, um, the clearest restriction that relates to some of the property tax proposals and discussions that have been ongoing, the clearest restriction is that um, taxpayers cannot um, funds cannot be used to help taxpayers meet their property tax obligations. 
Um, the language is that fund payments may not be used for government revenue replacement, including the provision of assistance to meet tax obligations. So I'm seeing on my screen, um, I'm not sure which page this is on. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. I, I you just have trouble down. finding the email. So, but it's coming. I got it. Okay. Um, has ever has everybody? Because uh, this stuff is fairly important. Has everybody got it? Um, if you don't, could you raise your hand and let me know so that I can um, make sure that people have it? Um, and is, these are this is guidance that Vermont requested. Is that right? Or is this guidance that has gone this out to is, all states? This is guidance that's been posted on the U.S. Treasury's website. So I don't believe don't that this is. I don't know if Vermont asked these particular questions. Um, but this is available, this is for all students. It's not, it wasn't a response to Vermont. No, not directly. Okay. Um, so the it's on actually page five is where the clearest um, restriction is laid out where it says that fund payments um, may not be used for government, government revenue replacement, including the provision of assistance to meet tax obligations. And that's particularly in response to property tax. But let me let's slow down and make sure that people have the are, are on the right page. Um, the page five. I guess the version of I, I had of this earlier just pulled out the section, so now I got to find them. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, okay. So that's that's really the clearest restriction. Um, that relates to the discussions that have been going on about um, creating a new COVID-19 specific property tax and then providing a credit against it. So this language does, this guidance does seem to preclude that sort of um, grant funding. There are several other, again, I've just started going through this this morning. So I really can just make a few high level points about the guidance that's provided here. Um, there is also a discussion in, about um, utility fees in particular about essential services that states um, if a government is providing grants to individuals facing economic hardship to allow them to pay utility fees in particular and thereby continue, continue to receive essential services, that would be allowable, um, an allowable use of the funding and that would be based on more of a case by case basis. So for hardship in particular, and again, it has to be necessary um, and related to the COVID-19 um, uh, hardship. So th those are quite restrictive compared to what's been sort of debated in terms of property tax um, relief. Just looking at another. Um, yeah, so those are those are really the high level there. There is more guidance about transfers between um, levels of government, um, whether a unit of local government receiving a fund payment um, must or may transfer funds to other units of government. So there's a little more guidance. Um, again, transfers have to qualify as necessary expenditures. Um, so I could, I could get into that, but I don't know right now what the particular proposal would be, but there is, there's a little bit more guidance that's been provided. It's not um, necessarily the news that we wanted to hear in terms of allowable uses. So I guess I'll stop there and take questions. Uh, questions, um, anyone has? So, so just to, because uh, it's a, there's a lot of, um, lot of information, uh, sort of coming, coming out of the field, I guess I would say, if we're, so just to frame the discussion for this committee, um, if we're talking about the education fund, which is what we're talking about, you know, we have this idea that we're going to get through 20, we're going to end up with a deficit, we're going to, then we've got the list of, um, uh, uh, money pressures in uh, fiscal 21, which include restoring the reserves, paying back the deficit, paying for um, budgets that have been approved and, um, and uh, finding a source of revenue to make up for the lost sales tax revenue. Those are the four pieces. Um, so if we're looking at that problem, it seems to me that the, um, the only options that I can think of 
our put money into the education fund. So that's question number one. Is that allowed under the guidance? So the guidance that requires, I'm just sorry, I have some of the windows up. The, um, my understanding from the guidance is that would be considered replacing a revenue shortfall. So it would not be an allowable use. Um, let me just read, sorry to have to read this to you. Um, the requirement is that expenditures have to be incurred due to the public health emergency. Um, they can, expenditures can be used to respond to second order effects of the emergency, providing economic support um, from those suffering employment or business interruptions. Um, but al although a broad range of uses is allowed revenue replacement, in that case, putting it directly into a, a fund to make up for a shortfall is not permissible. So that, that first option is fairly clearly precluded. Under well, certainly the money to replace the lost sales tax revenue is not allowed, but what about money to pay for the budgets that got voted, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, it, that would be both, um, I think, captioned under whether it's a necessary expenditure inc incurred due to the public health emergency and whether um, it was budgeted prior to March 27th. Um, I'm, just, I'm just trying to work through what I see as the possibilities and I'm, I'm not expecting your answer to be different than it has been. I just want to, I just want to be sure that we, we've worked through the, um, worked through all the questions. Scott, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I, I think based on what I've just heard, I, I'm making a really strong argument that uh, education has a lot of second order effects to healthcare, primarily that um, our, a lot of our healthcare workers have our, have their kids in school and how are they going to work if, if I mean I, I think I would pursue a second order effects that um, this has a education has a really um, close connection to health care and health effects and healthy communities and its ability to fight a pandemic I'd be looking at that really closely uh, Peter uh, I'm I'm with Scott with a slightly different twist um, the way I'm taking the, the language literally, uh, and this is, I guess, a question for Abby, uh, the fact that uh, most school districts already had their budget in place uh, before the 27th because they met at town meeting, but nevertheless, what was budgeted at town meeting was for teachers to be in the school, in the classroom, doing what they usually do. And what we have done specifically because of COVID is completely change the way uh, the teachers are relating to students, including broadband, including computer, including, including IT. All those expenditures were not anticipated, not budgeted, unless you're reading it, Abby, uh, as if, uh, if a certain amount was budgeted, no matter how it was to be used, we couldn't apply to uh, receive support for that budgeted amount. And I'm, I'm struggling because I don't have the language in front of me at the moment. I just barely read it at 9.30 this morning, whether the argument could be made as Scott, I think has suggested um, as for secondary uh, effects. I'm saying, because we rewrote the job description and consequently told the local school districts to continue or the agency continue delivering education in a totally different way with very different costs, even if the total amount ended up being the same for, for FY20. I, I just think there's an argument there uh, that those expenditures had to be modified in light of COVID-19. Uh, Thanks. Can I answer? Yeah. Um, there is, and I, again, I apologize, I haven't really had enough time to digest this, but on the very first page of the new guidance, it does discuss online provision of um, educational services and that um, merely because it is provided from a different location or through a different manner, developing online instruction capabilities is not itself a substantially different use of public funds. So that Again, I haven't fully digested how that would um, fit into your concern, but I, I think some of these questions have been put to the US Treasury and they are starting to respond to them. And it tends to be 
overall the tone of this guidance is more restrictive than um, open. Well, and there is the 27 or 30 million that's available that goes directly to schools that is is directly related to their additional additional costs of providing meals and um, I assume also um, uh, online um, teaching. So um, that that money is not uh, under these these restrictions. Um, so they have provided some money. I, it, just for my own thinking, I'm going to go back to my my list of questions I've set out for myself. So if we it, to, to uh, deal with the fiscal 21 problem that we've defined, we can put money into the fund. And we've had some discussion about whether that's possible or not. I'm not taking it off the table, but you could one, that would, that would fix the problem if we had the money and we're allowed to put it in. Um, we can direct money to taxpayers, which is what we were talking about. And it seems as though this is not allowing us to do that, but I'm not taking that off the table yet either. Um, and we can direct money to schools. I, I don't. I don't know what the. Uh, where, what else? We, I mean, those seem to me the only three avenues. Um, and we have not talked much about what it would look like to direct money to schools. Although I think that's a little bit of what Scott and Peter are talking about. Um, so that's the framework I'm using to think through this. Um, and um, well, uh, um, that's that's assuming that we're. Um, you know, the, the other things you can do is you can cut spending and you can raise revenue. I mean, those are the tools that we have. Um, I don't think there are others. So, um, uh, George, you were on my list, but you decided not to speak. No. Oh, George. Yeah, okay, George. So, um, I was just going to say just before that piece at the bottom of page one going on to page two, that Abby was talking about that it's not substantially different. Um, but the, the, they are clear that um, the cost of diverting educational support staff or faculty to develop online learning capabilities, such as through providing information technology support, would be as long would be coverable expenses. It just it feels like it's gonna be. There's going to be some very careful slicing and dicing that we need to do to, you know, to uh, disperse this money, use this money. You want to respond to that or not? No. Uh, Scott. Yeah, I, I kind of, I mean, I, I don't see this any different than the broadband conversation. I mean, the reason monies are being allowed to funnel to broadband is because we're coming to the conclusion that from a health standpoint, broadband infrastructure is very important to the health and well-being of our communities. It's the same argument for education. Our schools are very important to the health and well-being of our communities. And um, we should be able to put COVID dollars towards the education fund uh, to support that. I'd make that case. I, I'd, I'd make them say no. Uh, other other comments, Sam. I, I I guess I'm hearing it a little differently. I mean, broadband is a completely new use of money, and so it's not like we're replacing lost revenues. In in the case of the education fund, we're very clearly replacing lost revenues, and I think it I think it's actually quite a bit different. Not that it's not a worthy purpose, and. I'm not the lawyer here, but I'm hearing that we're going to be in trouble if we use the money for that. So, I guess even even if we want to try to make the case, um, I think at the same time we have to assume that we're not going to uh, be successful in making the case and be thinking about um, two or three backup plans. Um, I don't, wouldn't want to put all all the eggs in that particular basket. Um, and then end up with uh, not just a deficit at the end of fiscal 20, but a much worse one at the end of 21. Robin. Here. I mean. oh, just really a comment. I, I, I feel like, Janet, you're really laying out all the possibilities that we can do on our own. 
um, and they're all awful uh, and because we don't have money. And, and so I really, I have to say, who does the what is who does the CARES Act care about? I just feel like we're not, you know. I mean, it's a, the federal. It really is about the federal um, restrictions and inability and and seem, seemingly lack of desire to actually help out the people who need it. So I'm very very frustrated by this, and I appreciate all the work to try to figure it out. But unless we get the federal government involved, I don't see how it's not going to be very painful for right. our citizens. Right. Well, even the three things I was laying out, you know, money into the fund, money to taxpayers or money to schools. The question is, can we use CARES Act to do one of those three things? Um, and I don't know whether we can. The, it seems like we can't put money into the fund, um, notwithstanding Scott's argument, which I agree we can pursue, but I don't want to do it to the exclusion of other thinking. Um, sounds like we can't give money to taxpayers. Um, so then the last one on my list anyway, is there a way to, to put money into schools uh, in addition to the 30 million that somehow buys down the budgets that they've adopted. Um, but then if whether we can do that or not, the, uh, the only other places we can look is to cut spending or raise revenue. Um, right. That I think I think that's the framework. And I went just so you know, after I read this at 730 this morning, I went through the same thing you went through, stomped around the house for a little while, <laughs> frustrated. Um, usually I vacuum when I feel like that. I didn't today, <laughs> but um, but you know, and then I don't, you know, at some point you've got to we have got to find money for the schools. We can't yeah. let schools fail. Um, and we can't ask taxpayers to pay, you know, 22 cents additional, um, I don't think. Um, so we're going to have to figure out solutions. And I think, um, you know, recognizing Scott's argument um, and Peter's, I think we need to look at all the, all the possibilities. Um, and that just makes our work uh, harder, one, because it's hard, and two, because there's not a clear path. Um, usually when there's a clear path, we all get together and we figure out sort of how to, how to walk down it together. Um, but this one, there isn't. Peter. Uh, it, if I may take on the role, <clears throat> um, sort of next bad boy, I have tried to put out feelers to find out whether new revenue sources are at all on the table from other uh, branches of government come up empty, as I'm sure you have. Uh, but we were very close uh, to coalescing around some new uh, opportunities. Um, and I, I really think, uh, as you've laid out, uh, not following up on that conversation leaves at least uh, one of the four or five opportunities unexplored. And I think we should resume that conversation, not necessarily before we've closed out 2020, um, because that's a sort of first first job is to close out this current year in as good a shape as we can do. But I'd, I'd, I'd hate to see us abandon the, the revenue discussions that we had going right up to early March. Thank you. Um, other people, anyone want to weigh in on that or on any of this? I mean, the two, the two revenue um, pieces that we were looking at uh, were candy, which always seems so, um, I don't know, that doesn't feel very weighty to talk about candy, but candy was one of the issues. Um, and the other um, was uh, what I'll refer to as the cloud tax, because it's too many words to talk about vendor hosted software. Um, and um, I, I have uh, had an exchange of, um, uh, messages with Graham about and with him and a conversation with Sam about uh, just thinking about Zoom, for example, um, it, would Zoom be taxed um, if we moved in the direction of vendor hosted software? Um, I think probably it would be. And you think about sort of where where is economic activity moving? That's a place that it's moving. Um, those are not th those I think are on the table still. Um, I, I um, they're not a lot of money. They're not, not enough money. And, um, and they're certainly not instant. Um, and the economy is not a great time to be doing this. So, um, but I agree, they stay on the table. I mean, the other, the other areas to look at 
uh, various tax expenditures, either in the property tax area or in the um, sales tax area. Um, so those are, I think, also things we need to talk about. Robin. Well, wow. one of the tax that we had tossed around um, theoretically was um, a clothing tax on items over, say, $200 mm -hmm. um, so that people could buy regular clothes without paying any taxes on that and necessities and many things. But luxury items over 200, I'm making up a number, mm -hmm. um, we would tax. Yeah. Not an easy time to be raising revenue. Um, yeah. But um, I'm still left with these, these, you know, we have to fund the schools and I don't think we can raise property taxes by 22 cents. So we have to do something. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in? I don't, I don't know that anybody said it. If they did, I apologize. We were also entertaining a revision of, of the uh, limits, uh, that is to say the, pardon the phrase, eligibility for a minimum tax on the theory that they were, there were lots of business models or some business models out uh, these days, uh, which uh, emphasized asset growth uh, and at the expense of tax liability. And so there were several firms that were fairly well healed, but they were spending their money on eligible items, which essentially reduced their tax exposure, but nevertheless uh, did, did wonders for their balance sheet. Yeah, uh, of course the corporate tax doesn't go into the education fund. So um, that would be a general fund discussion rather than it. Uh, are you still wanting to speak, Peter? Your hand is still raised. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, other, other, Mark, you wanna use some good ideas? Well, I, uh, I just came across an article in the Washington Post that suggests that the federal government, the Congress doesn't have the stomach to let states lay off police and fire and school teachers and that kind of thing and anticipating that we may get another package coming. So there may be another bite at this in terms of additional federal aid. Other than that, all I can think of is borrowing and that's yeah. not a great option either. So. Yeah. Right. That borrowing is, is, is a bandaid. I mean, it, it does right. not a solution. Yeah. Right. Anything else? I hate to end on this note, but I um, i mean, we can, George, it's something positive. Well, no, <laughs> as positive as it can be in this time and place. <laughs> um, but it's, it seems to me that there are gonna be some expenses across state government, which don't happen because responsibilities, um, or um, assets were moved to help the COVID-19 response. And it seems that those things could all be funded with this, this CARES Act money. Mm -hmm. But, um, and so, you know, there conceivably are some, some monies out there that were not spent which were budgeted, which would be nice to be able to redirect to the schools where we can't um, use this CARES money. But I just, I don't, it's gonna take some really deep digging and some really clever people to figure out how much of that exists and where it exists and um, can, we, can we recoup that money to, you know, to aid the schools. I mean, it may take a general fund appropriation again to the education fund, but it, it feels like there are so many things that we can use the CARES money for. Um, 
that there should be some savings of things that weren't being done or um, people who are working differently now. And so, you know, what was budgeted for them might be available. Yeah, that kind of a solution is so complicated because it's many tiny little pieces that need to fit together. Um, but it's part of what we need to be looking at. Uh, by the way, I just got an email from Graham who says that he thinks Zoom is already taxed because it's a telecommunication service that requires a subscription. And when he pretends to do an order, an upgrade, the order shows taxes on it. So we should, we, our problems are solved because we're going to have money flowing in. Yeah, um, Zoom ought to be paying a whole lot more than they were then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Although I did the free one myself. Um, I, I, Madam Chair, I think it, I mean, the department of tax might, sorry, be, able confirm, might be able to confirm that, but that's just my, my yeah. rudimentary way of figuring out whether things are actually taxable yeah. or not. It's actually way to do it. the service and see if taxes show up. In the case of Zoom, they did. So um, because it is subscription, I figured maybe that was the case, but um, it yes. looks like it might be. Right, already done. Yeah, thank you. I didn't realize you were here. I would have just, I just recognized you. Um, so um, interesting. Um, George, you're muted. You have to unmute. There are also some documents from Mark. Um, update on the the education. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll look at those. Yeah. Okay. That, that'll yeah, that'll be a cheerful note to end on, right? Um, maybe not. Uh, Mark, why don't you go ahead and um, let everybody sort of mull over some of the rest of this for a bit? Oh, you're muted too, Mark. You want me? You want to go over some of the balance sheets we were working on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I have one that shows you um, where we are um, under current law. I also did another one um, that has um, a couple options for FY21, and I think sitting here I found a problem in it. So I'm not sure it's ready for um, the committee to take a look at yet. Oh, okay. I'm oh, sorry about that. I just okay. I just okay. while I was sitting here. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry, I was looking at something while I was listening to you. So do you have something to go over or not? Because there's a mistake in it. Um, let me take a look here. Um, if you don't, that's okay. We're going to, so committee, we're going to meet tomorrow as well. So we have time to, uh, you know, think about all this and, um, and staff will have some time to, you know, do a little more analysis of what the guidance is showing us. So we'll, we'll come back to this tomorrow. Um, but uh, if Mark has something, we'll present it now. Yeah, I, I, I need to wait. It needs to be fixed. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, Peter. It's the, uh, what drew my attention uh, this morning uh, among Mark's documents was the one where he actually parsed out uh, COVID related uh, property tax um, and, and segregated essentially expenditures. And I guess my general question is uh, whether an inference I drew from that is uh, all of a sudden uh, extinguished given Abby's uh, interpretation of the uh, question and answer between the US Treasury and all of us who wanna know how to use care money or there really are uh, property tax values that are directly attributable to COVID. Uh, they were labeled like that and it, 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 it certainly gave me a, a warm feeling temporarily. Uh, yeah. yeah, if we um, if we ask the question of treasury, uh, the question isn't, uh, can, we re can we replace property taxes with COVID-19 funds? It's can we replace consumption taxes that with COVID-19 for the support of schools that make our communities healthy? It's not a property tax replacement. I'm not sure if I were treasury, maybe I'd be convinced, but 
<laughs> well, I just think we, I mean, we got to ask the question. We got to make the case. Yeah. If we don't, we know what the answer is. Yeah. yeah, I don't know the process. I'll find out the process for answering, you know, for getting a state specific uh, yeah. question answered. Um, so uh, uh, that's something um, yeah. that we should find out more about. I mean, maybe this is, maybe all of this is just an argument for CARES 4. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, anyway, Robin. Thanks. I think that's revenue replacement, no matter how we look at it. I, I'm, I guess I'm just not optimistic. And yes, I would hope for a CARES 4. Yeah. But in the meantime, we will plan for uh, life without a CARES 4. Because we got to. Hopefully, we wouldn't have to do it. But I think we need to plan for it. Uh, all right. Um, it's good to see everybody today. Unless anyone else has questions or something they want to offer, we'll see you tomorrow. I can't remember what time, Sorsha. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Yes. Um, and um, what I have on the agenda is the miscellaneous tax bill. I wanted to uh, get to a place where I think now that the floor is moving a little more easily, we can, um, I don't know if it's all that easy, but it, things move. Um, I think it would be time to uh, move that bill out of the committee. Um, and so we can have a discussion tomorrow about whether we do just the most critical pieces that we sort of isolated a couple of weeks ago or whether we wanna do the whole thing. Um, and uh, so, that, that will be the gist of the discussion, but we'll also spend a few minutes on this subject, just so in assuming that staff has had time to do a little more analysis. Uh, thank you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Okay, I'm ending the live stream now.